Okay, I think we're ready to start. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automating Trade Preference with SAP GTS. My name is Kayleen. I am the Marketing Manager at Crypting, and we are joined by our customer, Tremco. We have Kevin Riddell, International Logistics Manager at Tremco, presenting with us today. On the next slide, I will just go over a quick housekeeping note. If you do have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel shown here. Now, a short introduction to Crypt. Crypt is a leading global trade and supply chain consulting firm, providing implementations, upgrades, customizations, and support. As I mentioned, we focus on the supply chain. The SAP products would include GTS, TM, EWM, and HANA. We also have our own products, which complement the SAP supply chain. They're all add-on products and fully customizable. Crypt has authored six books and several dozen white papers. Our most recent book, A User's Guide to SAP GPS, is actually co-authored by today's pre presenter, Kevin Riddell. Now on the next slide. These are just some highlights that differentiate Crypt. Uh, Crypt is, has extensive supply chain consulting experience with over 300,000 hours of um, SAP supply chain consulting. We work closely with SAP for co-innovation and product investments, including testing products and ramp up. Additionally, Crypt India is an extension of Crypt US, which we can leverage for project support and development. Now on the next slide, you will see, this is just an overview of Crypt products. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but as you can see, Crypt supply chain add-on products, um, we do offer cloud options for your supply chain, GTS integration, regardless of your ERP system. Um, we have an analytics and reporting tool for end-to-end -to -end supply chain visibility, an annual maintenance package for ongoing support, and customizable UX services, leveraging the power of SAP Fiori and Persona. And on the next slide is just a quick glance at some of Crips customers. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Kevin from Trumco. Kevin? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to everyone who showed up today. I apologize in advance if you hear me uh, sniff or clear my throat and just getting over a small bug, but I'm going to do my best to get through this sounding healthy. Again, I'm Kevin from Tremco Incorporated. I'll start with just a little bit of background on myself as well as Tremco. Uh, I've been at Tremco for 21 years. My current role is International Logistics Manager. I'm responsible for customs as well as trade compliance throughout North America, uh, U.S., Canada. Our Mexico activity is limited. We use SAP GTS, and that is my preferred tool for trade compliance. Uh, I'm the business process owner for GTS at Tremco, so I'm not IT. I'm actually on the business side. I'm a member of the ASUB GTS User Influence Council, and as mentioned, I have co-authored a two-part book with Rajan from Crypt, The Practical Guide to SAP GTS. And for those on the line that I've said that to before, I apologize that it's not released yet, but I assure you it is not a figment of my imagination, or mine and Rajan's, I should say. The book will be coming shortly. The little background for Tremco itself, Tremco is rightfully called the Tremco Group. It's a, uh, a number of companies that form a uh, brand name. Founded in 1928 with the head office still in Cleveland, Ohio. Over 2,000 employees worldwide, uh, just shy of a billion dollars in revenue. We're a manufacturer. Our products are primarily chemical products used in the building industry. So uh, construction products of a chemical nature, such as coatings, sealants, adhesives. There's multiple divisions that specialize in various aspects of the construction business. Uh, more can be learned at the website, tremcoinc.com. And this is a visual of several of the business units that make up the Tremco Group. If anybody wishes to know more about Tremco, of course, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Our background as it relates to SAP and GTS, we implemented SAP ECC in 1998, 17 years ago. Uh, I remember those days. I had been at Tremco only a few years at the time. We implemented GTS itself much more recently. We implemented version 10.0 
With the go live date at the start of 2012, the project itself was in 2011. And we are still on version 10.0, which will be significant, I'll mention later. We also run some other SAP modules, uh, CRM, WMS. I personally have only exposure or knowledge of the ECC and GTS products. One other thing I should have mentioned, uh, head office is in Cleveland, but I actually live in Toronto, Canada. That's where I am right now. I share my time between Toronto and Cleveland, but there was no way I was leaving Toronto today because the Blue Jays are going to win game five of the division series in about two hours. And my apologies to anybody on the call from Texas. Tremco is a primarily North American operation with sales globally. So we, we sell into any market uh, that's legal, of course, but our manufacturing base is in North America, along with a small one in Australia. U.S. and Canada trade represents the majority of our activity. And as a result of that, we are saving $4 million approximately in duty every year by claiming North American free trade. Uh, which is significant and leads to what we're here to discuss today. We're also taking advantage of a growing number of other free trade agreements, uh, but NAFTA remains the most significant one for us. And there's, in recent years, been increased attention on non-free trade origin determinations. Uh, I get called into Buy America, Buy American, Trade Agreement Act, Made in USA claims. Tremco has five legal entities uh, in play. That's actually grown. We've had an acquisition, so I need to say six legal entities. Uh, we have dozens of manufacturing locations throughout the USA and Canada. And we have, uh, as time goes on, uh, an increasingly diverse source of raw materials. So our raw material source 20 years ago was 95% from North America. Now we're sourcing, as many companies are worldwide, India, China, etc. We have 10,000 SKUs uh, to play with, going all the way from raw material up to finished good, including intermediates. As a result, uh, I can confidently tell you that manually auditing our bills of material in order to comply with free trade agreements is not an option. Uh, it's just not possible. Now, why does this matter? Why did I just go through uh, this detailed background of Kremco, what we do, where we sell, and our involvement in free trade agreements? Well, anybody who's touched a free trade agreement or has signed a certificate should be aware that there's an obligation to audit your bill of material before you sign the certificate. Many companies have uh, a clerical role of signing certificates of origin, uh, certificates of origin, uh, pardon me, maybe at an order desk uh, where they interface with the customers. Does that individual or those individuals actually have the knowledge they need to verify that the products qualify and are they performing those audits. Under most free trade agreement texts, you are expected to know and have done that due diligence before you sign the certificate. If these individuals in your company sign a certificate of origin for a product that truly wasn't eligible for that free trade agreement, penalties could be applicable. In other words, are you auditing your products before somebody in your organization signs the certificate of origin? What we're looking at here is a screenshot from U.S. Customs uh, and Border Protection website. And this is what they post to the public called priority trade issues. It's basically a, a warning from them, if you will, that these are the things we deem more important than most and are more likely to audit. In that list of current priority trade issues, you'll see trade agreements. I can tell you, having lived it uh, the last decade plus, that Post 9-11, customs, U.S. customs especially, really did have a focus on security. 90% uh, of my interaction with U.S. customs revolved around their customs trade partnership against terrorism. That is changing. Uh, we're seeing more CF-28 form request for information related to free trade agreement eligibility, uh, basically demanding that we demonstrate our products do qualify for NAFTA. And as this screenshot shows, and as I have other anecdotal evidence, they are really sending the message to the public that free trade agreements are on their radar. They, they intend to audit that companies are complying with the rules. I like to put this one up just to get 
people's attention. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, it's the only case I'm aware of of an individual going to jail for a free trade agreement certificate. I'm not sure what the details of the case are. Uh, looks like they invoked the Patriot Act for whatever reason, but uh, it's it is a real case: uh, jail time for false NAFTA certificate. Realistically, this is what your company is going to face if you're found out of compliance with a free trade agreement. This is the U.S. Customs uh, standard schedule of penalties. Starting at the bottom, if they were to deem you to be merely negligent, you're going to be looking at two times the duty that was avoided through the free trade agreement uh, that should not have been avoided. Thinking back to my statement about Tremco, $4 million annually, that alone is significant. Now, if you're deemed to be gross negligent, you can take that up to four times. And worst case scenario, a fraud is involved. Uh, you could be on the hook for the full domestic value of the merchandise, not just the duty uh, on that merchandise. And something else that is starting to appear more recently in the news is the Department of Justice is willing to make False Claims Act uh, indictments against companies. This is a real example from the Department of Justice website. And when you drill into the details, it was for knowingly providing inaccurate information regarding the country of origin of the goods. Not a free trade agreement per se, but uh, in my opinion, closely related. And, and any company that has a automated compliance program to deal with free trade agreement compliance would likely not run afoul of these other related rules such as the Trade Agreements Act. So I have covered Tremco's exposure to free trade agreements as well as uh, industry in general and also why it's important, why it's significant, uh, but why is it difficult? Why do I st say that we can't do this without an automated solution? There's a growing number of free trade agreements, first of all. Uh, NAFTA may be the most significant for us, but it's one of only 400 in play in the world and at this point in time, that's according to the World Customs Organization on their website. The U.S. in particular has free trade agreements with uh, 20 countries, I believe, as of right now. And if anybody is following the elections either in Canada or the U.S., uh, you've definitely heard of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which essentially is, is a free trade agreement between the U.S., Canada, and a dozen other countries. Uh, and then, of course, there's Europe. Both the U.S. and Canada are in talks over free trade with the European Union. By this time next year or two years from now, we as companies based in North America could have our number of countries that we have free trade agreements in play with doubled. And each of these agreements tends to have its own rules for determining rules of origin just to make life more difficult. Uh, the rule you have to follow to qualify a product for NAFTA is not going to be the rule you have to follow to qualify a product for the TPP. And on that subject, I mentioned earlier that we were on version 10.0. Version 10.1 of GTS brings with it a couple new uh, methods of rule of origin, if you will, the build up and build down method that were not in 10.0. I, I don't have them in my system because we haven't implemented 10.1. But the early indications from some news reports I've read uh, that TPP will use the build-up, build-down method, which is the favored method uh, in the Asian marketplace. Uh, so if I want to use GTS a year or two from now to, to comply with G, or sorry, too many acronyms. If I want to use GTS a year or two from now to comply with TPP, I may have to either look at 10.1 or uh, 11.0. Something to think of. This is just a visual of the various of some of the rules of origin that uh, the U.S. has with various agreements. Sorry, there's NAFTA, Chile, Singapore, etc. And each one comes with its own rules of origin. This is a nice visual that U.S. Customs actually posts publicly on their website, but it gives you an indication of the more agreements you deal with, the more rules you have to deal with. And if we get back to those thousands of SKUs, each of those have to be checked against each of these agreements separately. So the, the level of complexity just really becomes exponential uh, as more and more agreements come into play. Here's a specific example of different rules of origin. 
Uh, rules of origin tend to be uh, tariff code driven, HTS driven. Um, I won't get into that in too much more detail, but if there's questions at the end, uh, I'll leave it to that. But here's a specific example of NAFTA versus the U.S.-Chile free trade agreement and how different rule of origins are for Chapter 25. Since GTS makes its logical determinations based on tariff code, the fact that you have the NAFTA rule of origin loaded and in play does not mean you're ready for Chile free trade. This is a, a complex slide, I know, uh, but I was trying to demonstrate the complexity at play here. Uh, so if you'll bear with me, I, I believe it makes sense. It makes sense to me anyway. I hope it does to others. If you start at the left in the middle column and work your way to the right, it's the process of determining your products, uh, free trade eligibility, making a final determination. Yes or no, it qualifies for NAFTA, if you will. Along the way, there's a number of factors that influence that decision and any change in those factors affects your end decision. So statement of origin from your vendor, is, does the raw material qualify? The HS number of any raw materials that don't qualify. Is it sourced from multiple vendors and are they of the same origin? Is it made in multiple plants and are they in the same country? Maybe it's made in Toronto as well as Cleveland. Uh, and what's the HS number of your finished good which drives the rule of origin? And you must do this for each free trade agreement for each SKU. I do this to demonstrate why a manual process won't work because you need some sort of automation to handle the, uh, the fluidity, if you will, of all these different data points. A change in any one of those factors can affect your end decision. That's not manageable with pen and paper uh, in my experience. What we have here is a, a bill of material of ours. This is from Tremco's system. It's the list of components in the bill of material, whether or not they qualify for NAFTA, their tariff code and their value, all the key data required to uh, make a final determination. So, in light of how serious the free trade agreement is, uh, how much exposure we have to it, uh, what's our risk level, and how difficult it is to comply with the rules. What was Tremco's solution? I don't think there's any surprise. Our solution uh, is SAP GTS. And what you're seeing here is actually the screen from GTS where the previous slide's data was exported from. And this is a, a visual of one of our products in SAP GTS, and it's having its actual free trade agreement status determined right here. The final result is yes, this product does qualify for NAFTA based on all that essential information. Where are the raw materials made? Uh, what is their tariff code if they're not originating? What's their value, et cetera, et cetera. And what you see here is a list of Tremco products and whether or not they qualify. And this is the GTS database of determined products and it is now ready to issue a certificate of origin for these products, positive or negative, as to whether they qualified for NAFTA. So item one at the top of the list, uh, 9607243223, is eligible for NAFTA free trade, and if I were to issue a certificate to a customer, it would be a positive determination and a completed certificate. Down at the bottom, uh, item 123, is not eligible, and if I were to issue a statement against that, it would be negative and, and state that the product is not qualified. So returning to my mess of a slide, uh, my complexity slide, if you will, how much of those varying factors does GTS help with or automate? The answer is all of them. It manages the statements from our vendors, so it, it actually acts as a solicitation tool and database of our vendor certificates. It knows which raw materials are sourced from which vendors uh, and so are relevant and is able to issue the request for a certificate to those vendors for those products. It knows if we purchase the raw material from multiple vendors and takes that into account in its considerations. So imagine that I purchase a product from both Canada and India and the Canadian vendor issued me a statement that the product qualifies. The system knows we also purchase it from India and it's waiting for uh, a determination on that specific source, that in SAP terms, that info record. 
the HS number for non-originating materials, which is how the system will perform its calculation on uh, what's called a tariff shift to see if it is substantially transformed, is housed in GTS. We, we maintain all our raw material and intermediate classification in GTS. Is the product made in multiple plants? GTS is aware of where the product is made because it's integrated to ECC. And if we were to change the bill of material on a product so that it is now made in Cleveland as opposed to Toronto, uh, GTS is aware of that. The HS number for the finished goods, similar for or similar to the components, is maintained in GTS. And you can maintain as many free trade agreements as you wish to configure in GTS. So GTS is capable of automating all these uh, variables. So if there is a change in any one of them, the net result, the determination result, will be updated. Now, I've painted a rosy picture on how GTS works, and it does. I, I can sit here and tell you I use it exclusively as my source of certificates of origin for NAFTA. There were lessons learned uh, and best practices that I feel I can share, and anybody looking to go down this road and implement GTS preference, uh, I would hope learning from our experience will save you time and money. We went live with GTS, as I mentioned, in early 2012. Uh, preference was live by March. As of March 2012, the system allowed for the auditing of bills and materials. So I could go into it on March 1st and uh, say, run determination, is this product eligible for NAFTA or not? I could also generate certificates of origin for customers and solicit certificates from my vendors. But it wasn't until 2013 that I was actually doing those functions. And it wasn't until 2014 that GTS became the exclusive source of my certificate of origin because uh, nobody in the organization is allowed now to issue an after certificate outside of GTS. So why did that take two years? And how could you, if you're beginning a project of your own, reduce that amount of time? The data cleansing was underestimated by myself, uh, bottom line. There was a number of key parts of master data that have to be in place or the system is crippled. The system can only work with what it's given. And if the data feeding the system from ECC is uh, incorrect or incomplete, it just can't function. A big one is tariff codes. You need to have tariff codes set up for all of your raw materials. We hadn't done a good job of that in ECC. And when we transferred our tariff codes from ECC to GTS, I was surprised by how many blank fields there were and also how many incorrect uh, tariff codes there were. We manually populated tariff codes in ECC and there was no guarantee that those tariff codes were valid. When we went to GTS, we used a subscription service, so only valid tariff codes can be uh, plugged into the material master, the product master, and if it was incorrect, it came over blank. Procurement type. I was actually warned about this uh, by another customer of Crypt, and I just didn't take it serious enough. And when we went live, I was shocked by what a mess our procurement type data was. I will show you what that means on the next slide, so I'll move on quick. Alt bombs. Uh, Anybody in manufacturing is in the habit of creating alternate bombs for various reasons. A bill of material, for anyone who's not sure. Uh, it could be because you have one bill of material for a batch under a thousand pounds and one bill of material for batches over a thousand. Or maybe you have a bill of material that you use all the time and you have a alternate one that you use when you use a, uh, a substitute raw material, maybe a trial raw material. Something that I see in our business is R&D might want to try a new raw material as a substitute. They'll do it one time and one time only, set up an alternative bomb, never do it again. But if those alt bombs are not getting expired properly in ECC, if they're not given validity end dates, validity two, I think is the proper term, uh, then GTS believes they're still valid and has no reason to think otherwise. Every alt bomb in ECC that does not have a validity to date that has come and gone that is in the past will be deemed relevant for GTS. 
The same goes for plant changes. I uh, gave the scenario earlier, we make it in Toronto one day and then we're going to start making it in Cleveland. If we don't properly expire the bomb in the Toronto plant, GTS believes it's made in both facilities. So data discipline uh, just was a, was a problem for us. It hadn't hurt anybody in the business before, so it just nobody's to blame. It just wasn't a priority. Once GTS got put in place, we had a whole bunch of data we had to focus on. Uh, solicitation of vendor certificates should precede the software. That's my fault. Uh, I just didn't have all the vendor certificates in hand by the time the software went live, so I, I didn't have the data I needed to work with. I would recommend have a separate team address the data cleansing alongside or even prior to the software implementation if you want to maximize your return on investment. If you want to have the value from the software, uh, getting, getting that value as soon as possible after go live, have a separate team focus on data cleansing. I was in the situation where I had to deal with both at once. I was the business lead on implementation as well as responsible for data cleansing. It just didn't work. I, I think having two separate teams would be preferable. And as much as possible, mass populate data in GTS through tables. Uh, and the one big example I'll give is additional conditions. I'll explain them again, uh, so I won't get into too much detail right now. But uh, additional conditions are one big example. And anywhere else that you can, spare the user's manual maintenance of data if it can be loaded as a table. So here is the procurement type I referred to. You're looking at a material master in ECC. In GTS, this field's called procurement indicator, but it, it's the same data. It, it integrates direct to ECC and draws from it. Any material master in ECC can have a procurement type of in-house, which means we make it, external, which means we purchase it, both, which means we both purchase it and make it, or no procurement, and I'm still unsure why anybody would ever choose no procurement, but the other three are, are definitely relevant. In my experience at Trumco is we had, when in doubt, used both. And because it didn't interfere with any other business function, uh, it had never caused a problem. It had just become standard business practice. And if you think back to our go-live on ECC in 1998 and a go-live on GPS of 2012, that was over a decade of uh, populating of both procurement types in our material masters. And the problem with that is GTS, if it's in-house, wants to audit the bomb, and if it's external, demands a certificate of origin from your vendor. If it's both, it, uh, it demands both. So even though it's audited your bomb, it believes there's a certificate of origin from a vendor somewhere, and it will not pass your product as originating until you meet that requirement. And since you don't actually buy it from a vendor, you make it, it's impossible to produce that certificate, you end up in a catch-22 uh, and your product will not qualify until the procurement type is fixed. I can explain that better to anybody who's interested, uh, but hopefully that makes sense for now. This is the additional condition function uh, and it is a, it's a slow process for a user to maintain after go live. Uh, to give you a high-level explanation, a rule of origin in, in any free trade agreement tends to be tariff code driven. So it makes its decision based on the tariff codes of any product in your bill of material that does not itself originate. There are often additional requirements above and beyond that that are not tied to tariff code and are text-based, if you will, and I'll show you an example. GTS can't interpret those. It can't deal with those. I don't see how it could. In all fairness, I don't see how any system could. Uh, so you, as a user, have to maintain a statement in the system as to whether or not you meet that additional requirement. I'll show you the example here. This is the rule of origin for tariff code 320649 in the NAFTA rules of origin. And the rules are generally tariff driven, subheadings 28 through 38, etc. If it sounds like I'm talking another language, I apologize, but I don't think we have time to really dwell on that too much. 
But there's also sometimes additional conditions in there, such as if it's based on hexacyanoferrates. And that has nothing to do with the tariff code. The, the, the product will have the same tariff code, 320649, whether or not it's based on hexacyanoferrates. But it's key to the determination. So GTS requires you to tell it, does, is this product based on hexacyanoferrates? And getting back to the previous slide, this is the screen where that's maintained in GTS. And I know I've taken a long time to get to this point, but the bottom line is if you could populate these additional conditions with a table, uh, it would save a great deal of time for your users. Because I can say from experience, I spent uh, quite a bit of time populating codes and their additional conditions in GTS. Now something else I, I just wanted to touch on, and this isn't unique to whether or not you've automated your free trade compliance, but in my opinion, it's another reason why automation is essential, is the timing issue. Uh, free trade agreements are structured in such a way that you can't issue your customer a certificate until you have determined your product, and you can't determine your product until your vendors have issued certificates for all your components. Well, unfortunately, in most supply chains, those vendors have vendors and need to determine their own product. And they can't determine their own product until their vendors issue them certificates and so on and so on. And maybe your customer uh, uses your product to make a further product. And the, the entire process backs up. And this visual here is just meant to illustrate if our end result is that I'm issuing a certificate of origin to my customer January 1st, uh, saying my product qualifies, here you go, you're good to go for 2015, one year blanket certificate. Well, that means that I've issued, or sorry, that means that I've performed my determination before January 1st. Some point before the end of the year, I've analyzed my bomb. And I can't analyze my bomb until all my vendors, my component vendors, have issued me certificates. When did that happen exactly? And if you push back even further, those component vendors, in all fairness, can't issue a certificate to me until they've determined their own product's qualifications or eligibilities, which requires them to solicit certificates from their subcomponent vendors. And in, in, in practice, I'm getting NAFTA requests in August from customers, and I am trying to get statements from vendors throughout the fall, uh, often with no luck. Uh, this scenario on screen is actually fairly simple. It assumes my customer is the end of the supply chain. If my customer uses my product into another product, they're not going to tolerate me issuing my certificate to them January 1st because that prevents them from giving their customer the certificate January 1st. So I, I raised the timing issue just to uh, give you something to think about if you're planning an implementation project. My date of March for Go Live really didn't work well because uh, in light of this, there was no hope of having 2012 certificates of origin in my customers' hands uh, because even if the master data had not been a problem, it's just not feasible to go through the entire determination solicitation process and issue your certificates that quickly. So. Consider a fall go live, perhaps, uh, so that you can maximize your value, value going into the next year. Maybe if you had a go live target of uh, October, you could realistically be looking at issuing your customers' certificates by January. Now, just a quick talk on cost justification. Uh, if you are considering going with GTS for preference and you need to uh, internally justify why are we doing that, I think there's really two types of companies at this stage. Uh, you're either currently taking advantage of free trade agreements in a non-compliant manner, uh, meaning you don't actually know the products qualify, or you're just not taking, of any, taking advantage of a free trade agreement unless you can be certain. So you're paying duty that maybe you could avoid. Now that is unless you're one of the rare companies that has thrown enough resources at this to deal with it manually, uh, and in which case that's great. But uh, I personally believe most companies fall into one of these two categories. They're either claiming free trade preference in a non-compliant manner or paying duty that they could avoid if they could 
get to the point where they're compliant with the free trade agreement. So if you're in category A, which is where Tremco was, automating trade preference is really a cost avoidance. It's ensuring that we never get hit with penalties, that we don't end up having to pay this duty that we're currently avoiding. If you're in category B, it's a much easier justification. You can take that duty you're currently paying uh, and demonstrate it to your management and say, we could avoid paying this duty. It's a slam dunk. Anybody in category B, in my opinion, should be able to justify uh, a GPS preference implementation fairly easily. In category A, it takes getting compliance and legal people involved and explaining to them the risk if we don't get our, uh, our act in order, if you will. Now, returning just quickly to the book I mentioned earlier with Rajan, part two, which will cover preference specifically, actually has a section on this and uh, includes um, a cost justification calculator template, if you will, that you can use to help sell the, the project internally. Beyond the core cost justification, which I just covered, there are fringe benefits. Uh, which we didn't expect to find, but now when I look back, I realize how much it really has helped us. The first one, uh, no surprise, it instilled master data discipline, um, which was much needed. We now take procurement type, procurement indicator, uh, all bombs, expiring bombs, much more serious, and we have processes in place to uh, clean that up. I'd love to tell you it's perfect, but I can confidently tell you that it is better than it was. Uh, and without the GTS preference project, uh, it would not have been cleaned up because there would have been no motivation to. And it has helped in other areas. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody on the call is from the chemical field. I, I didn't get the background of any uh, attendees. But in the chemical world, we've recently gone through the GHS uh, labeling changes, the changes to the way we have to show our hazards on our labels. And many companies, Stremco included, have gone with SAP's EHS solution to comply with that. Well, those alt bombs and expired bombs affect that module the same way they affect GPS. The EHS module is all about analyzing the bill of material, if you will. Uh, if you haven't expired that old bill of material from Toronto, EHS can't understand that any more than GPS understand that. So looking back, the project to implement GTS preference actually helped with the project to implement uh, EHS for GHS compliance. Uh, again, I apologize for the acronyms. I can blame the government for that. Uh, it was a real fringe benefit that if we hadn't implemented GTS, a future project which relies on the same master data would have had that problem at that point. It forced reviews of uh, many processes that are often neglected, such as the signing of certificates of origin. It was rather surprising to learn who was signing certificates and under what conditions. Uh, and this was a chance to clean all that up and centralize things. And it could lead to some new understandings about what you buy and where you buy it from. And I'll, I'll give you a real world example of how this has actually helped us recently. We had to go through an audit uh, not too long ago on what we source from Russia and or Ukraine, in particular looking for uh, potential Crimean origin goods. And I had the data there. Because of what we've done and because of the solicitations and the information we now have, the database, I was able to answer that extremely quickly. Before we had done our GTS project, that would have been a significant project to get that information for the auditors. So there are Fringe benefits that are difficult to uh, quantify, to monetize, if you will, but I am certain that anybody who automates their preference will find the same benefits that we have. Another benefit to the project is after you've gone through your first implementation, let's use NAFTA, which is Kremko's example, it's much easier to extend it to a new free trade agreement. The effort to get NAFTA in place never has to be duplicated. So now we can implement uh, US-Israel free trade agreement or TPP when the time comes. It will not be the same learning curve because most of the work is uh, front-end front loaded, if you will. The configuration work is done. 
the data maintenance is done, uh, the processes are now in place. So we can load new free trade agreements uh, much easier simply by entering the rules of origin. It's really the key. Uh, luckily, the subscription content providers, such as Customs Info, are adding more and more free trade agreements all the time. Uh, to create rules of origin without subscription content would be more work, but with the content it is really uh, not that big a project. And also I encourage you to consider GTS for non-traditional free trade agreements. Uh, preference determinations that are not free trade agreements, if you will. I mentioned Buy America, uh, Buy American, which I wish were the same, but they're actually different. The generalized system of preferences, something else that's been in the news quite a bit recently. Uh, country of origin marking rules, uh, whether or not you have the right to claim made in USA on your label. The Federal Trade Commission has rules about this. Um, there's only a certain amount of foreign material allowed in your bill of material or your process order uh, before you are disqualified and can no longer make that claim. GTS is capable of managing these non-free trade agreement requirements and we recently have been able to demonstrate this. I may have talked with some of the people on this call over this over the last year that uh, I certainly mentioned it in an earlier presentation that we were looking to have Buy American compliance in GTS. Thankfully we've been working with Crypt on that and we do have a solution in place and I will be able to show you. What you're looking at right now is a results screen, a determination screen of one of our products and whether or not it qualifies for NAFTA as well as whether or not it qualifies for Buy American. It, it's called BA49 which is uh, Code of Federal Regulations 49 but it, it's Buy American. And why was why is this significant? Uh, somebody might be wondering why I'm putting this slide up as opposed to another agreement such as uh, Canada-Chile. The Buy American rules, like any country of origin marking rules, are single country specific and GTS is primarily designed to allow for multiple countries within a free trade agreement, which is perfectly natural. So if you look at the box on the left side, line number one represents uh, NAFTA, line number two represents Buy American. And what this screen is, is this is actually maintaining the origin status of a product from a vendor. So in line one you're making a statement that is it NAFTA or not and if so what's the origin and in line two you're making a statement is it Buy American eligible or not and if so what's the origin. For NAFTA there's three countries Canada, Mexico, USA. For the Buy American one there's only one US. This had been our hang up if you will. This was where we were stalled how to make a rule of origin in GTS work with a single country and again I'm happy to say that uh, it is working and it was through Crypt uh, that we came up with this solution so I encourage anybody who's interested if you have Buy America, Buy American needs to pursue this further. It, it's actually quite easy to implement because you don't need to load complicated rules of origin uh, which is the good news. So that is the end of my formal presentation. Uh, apologize if I rushed through some points. I wasn't sure how I would end up on time. Normally I'm presenting in, uh, in, in person, in a room, and there's more interaction and it tends to take longer. So at this point, I think we have lots of time for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to transfer back to Kyleen to control that. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for that presentation. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box. Um, if we don't get to your question today, we have some contact information up here. Feel free to reach out. And if you have questions specific for Kevin, I can um, definitely forward those on to him and we can get those answered as well. So I will dive right into the questions here. Um, first of all, it looks like we have a Blue Jays fan on the line. <laughs> um, go Blue Jays. Let's see. Uh, will a copy of the presentation be available? Yes, to everyone who is attending and even those who have registered and were not able to attend, we will send them a copy of the presentation and a link to the recorded webinar. Um, Kevin, this one's for you. What will the producer show as well? 
Um, I guess I'm going to have to guess which program it's referring to. If it if it's referring to just a general free trade oh, agreement. Oh, sorry about that. It looks like there was a previous question. So the first question okay. was, if your company manufactures a finished product good in the U.S. and Canada, and you ship the material into the U.S. plant, then issue an LTSD out of the U.S. admin unit, what will the country of origin field show? So it, the, the start of that question was that it's made in two countries? If um, your company manufactures a finished good in the U.S. and Canada, okay. and you ship the material into the U.S. plant. I can tell you, thankfully, that I don't actually have that scenario. I, what I've got is I've got products that have been formerly made in Toronto, now made in the U.S. Uh, and the reason I had raised the example was because you have to expire that old Toronto bill of material or you confuse the system. I don't actually have a product currently made in two countries, uh, and I'm not certain how the system would deal with that. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, investigate that and get back to the person who asked that if there's a way to. Yes, we do have the um, asker's name here, so we can look into that and definitely get back to you, Shane. Now we have another question here. It says, aren't the Buy American TAA rule, rules centered more on the concept of substantial transformation in a given country. How does the system handle this? Okay, I'll, I'll cover both uh, because Buy America and Buy American are different, uh, or all three. I'll, I'll run through all three quick. TAA, the Trade Agreement Act, allows for foreign sourcing as long as the foreign country in question has a free trade agreement in place. So. If a U.S. government agency is buying my products, but it's made in Canada, TAA is effectively allows an exemption under Buy American if the product qualifies for NAFTA. So the TAA allows you to demonstrate that, yes, my product's foreign, but you can still buy it because we have a free trade agreement with your country. Buy American is a 50% origin rule. So 50% of the content of that good must be uh, U.S. origin for you to be eligible for any contract in the U.S. that is demanding by American uh, eligibility. That's the one I was referring to that has a very easy rule of origin. The rule of origin is one line and one line only, 50%, regardless of tariff code. By America is a little different. It's used only by the Department of Transportation and it's more difficult to comply with, in my opinion. You, there's no percent threshold, but all intermediates, all sub-assemblies, if you will, must be made in the U.S. The origin of components beyond that point are irrelevant. So if I have a finished good with two intermediates going into it, those intermediates must be made in the U.S. Their sub-components can come from anywhere. And how you comply with that in GTS is you flip from a I might get this wrong off the top of my head, but you flip from a top down to a bottom up bomb explosion so that you limit the determination at the intermediate level. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question here. What drove you to an SAP solution versus a non-SAP system? Uh, primarily just the, the range of what GTS offers. We, this presentation has focused on preference exclusively. I've also done a presentation for ASUG that covered uh, the whole of our GTS implementation. So it's a software that let me comply with sanctioned party screening, preference, export license control. It allows me to house my classifications in one system. So it was the fact that it covered all of my needs in one platform. And then also the fact that it integrates so easily to ECC, that it, it's designed for integration with SAP ECC. Okay. Kevin, did you discover that you may not have been maintaining as many LTVDs from your vendors as you thought when starting this implementation? If so, how did you push on? Uh, sorry. If so, how did you push on your vendors to issue those vendor certificates to you? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, if anyone from customs is listening, I hope they'll show mercy on me because we've cleaned up our, our act. But 
Yes, I, I was surprised at how low a percent of our vendor statements we actually had. Our old process captured any foreign vendor very well because the moment the purchase order crossed a border, there was a customs bo broker transaction and I got involved and we solicited a certificate. It was the domestic vendors that surprised us. So the Cleveland plant purchases from a distributor in Akron, Ohio, if you will. We did not have a very good maintenance rate of certificates from that pool of vendors. And the fact that you purchase it from Ohio does not mean it's made in USA. And we were surprised at many of the results. Thankfully, I did not see very many product disqualifications. I had some fairly generous tariff shift rules to play with in my industry. Uh, caulking, paint, etc. cetera, have, have very generous rules. So even though there's foreign raw material, I still qualify. But to answer the question, I, I was surprised at what a low fill rate I had from vendor certificate requests. Okay. Does the NAFTA preference allow you to qualify your products bomb top down or bottom up? Which do you use and do you have a preference? It allows both and we're currently doing, and again this is where I, I hope I'm not getting it backwards, we're doing top down. Uh, if I got it backwards I apologize, but we're doing the full explosion. We, we do not classify our intermediates. We prefer to explode it completely and look exclusively at the raw materials. I'm not sure if if I can still control the slideshow here, but if I can get to that screen that showed one of our bills of material, I can explain. Here we go. You're looking at what I called our bill of material. It's not actually our bill of material because in that are some intermediates. So Item 294 and 406 maybe get combined to make intermediate 1, 2, 3. We're ignoring the intermediates when we do our determinations. I found it easier because then I don't require a tariff classification for my intermediate. If you go the other route, uh, bottom up, then you must have a tariff classification for all your intermediates and you must determine your intermediates before you determine your finished goods. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking to go buy America compliant, you'll have to do your determinations in that direction because that's how that agreement is, is structured. But for NAFTA, I prefer full explosion. Okay. Another question is, is this a capability of GTS or is this an add-on module? If the former, in what version was it introduced? Is this the single country preference we're referring to probably? I'm just going to assume that's what it refers to, uh, and the answer is it's existing functionality. It was just a a different way to configure. Um, that, that's the best way I can describe it without actually sitting with someone and showing them, and I'm not comfortable doing that without somebody from Crypt participating because we developed it together. Uh, but it, it's just a configuration method. It's existing functionality. Okay. All right. The person who's asking the question just uh, sent in the trade agreement manual, uh, the trade agreement management functionality. And another question is, can you also email your customers directly from GTS to send your LTSDs? If so, can you set up multiple email addresses for one customer to receive the LTSDs? We aren't currently doing that at Trimco. Uh, it's something I'd love to do. Uh, I should explain I'm I'm less limited by GTS's abilities than I am by my internal resources. Uh, I have to pick and choose my battles when I request uh, IT help with GTS. So no, I don't have that functionality active. Yes, it does exist. Uh, does it allow for multiple emails for a single vendor? I'm afraid I can't answer that, but I'd be happy to find out and get back to them. Okay, great. And it looks like the last question here is, did you have any issues calculating for VC using net cost or transaction method? No, and I've actually used both. Um, I can give a specific example. We generally use our uh, net cost for our VC. We just prefer it. Uh, it's cleaner. You've made a determination on your product once and once only, regardless of selling price. But I did have a product that was failing, and when I investigated why it was failing, it was because it had a 
raw material that did not originate and failed to tariff shift. So it was preventing uh, qualification. The only hope I had was what's called the de minimis rule, the 7% or less foreign content rule. And that can only come into play with transaction value because uh, the de minimis rule is looking for what you sold the product for. And I can tell you it worked. So I, I have done both. I have qualified most of our products with the net cost option, but I've also used it in a real example with transaction value. Okay. We just had two more questions come in. Uh, one is, do you master your materials in GTS or in ECC? Sorry. Do you master your materials in GTS or in ECC or another tool? The material master is in ECC, uh, and how the system functions is it takes the data it needs from ECC and brings it into GTS. There's one exception to that, and that is the classifications. I only do the classifications in GTS. Those classifications don't exist in ECC. Uh, we just did it so that there's one repository for data, and we can control who has access to it easier. Now, the, u the ECC users that want to view that data, we built a... Uh, bit of a custom query. So they can they can see the classifications in ECC by contacting GTS automatically, uh, but the maintenance is exclusively in GTS for classifications. Okay. When determining additional conditions, how do the conditions in GTS match up with the official rules of origin for NAFTA? It looks like there were six or seven conditions, but the rule only showed two. Um, that's partly my fault for only showing part of the rule of origin. Uh, it, it, it just would have been a big mess on the slide. If you look at the rule of origin for 320649, you'll see there, there are that many conditions. It, it is that complicated a rule. I only showed a small part of it for simplicity's sake. And, and to answer the bigger question, the additional conditions match the rules of origin perfectly. We use uh, customs info, Descartes, subscription data, and it includes the additional conditions. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, it looks like we've answered all the questions here. Thank you so much for presenting your implementation story and teaching us all about how Tremco uses trade preference. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, feel free to reach out to, um, to me. My email um, was on the slide deck. I'll be sure to send you all a copy of the presentation and, again, a link to the uh, webinar recording. Thanks, everyone. And Enjoy the rest of your day.